This week on Vaticano, the Vatican's Bambin Jesu Pediatric Hospital opens a children's palliative care center, realizing Pope Francis' message that it's always possible to provide care, even when it's not possible to heal. What can we learn from the church when it comes to leadership in today's society? And what is the role of Christianity in today's culture? Reflect with us on these two questions and travel with us to the nation of Malta and the Italian city of Arezzo and learn about history, the church, and the origins of the conclave. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. The Vatican Children's Hospital, Bambin Gesù, has opened the largest pediatric palliative care center in Italy. The center is dedicated to the care of children and adolescents with rare incurable diseases and the care of their entire families, affected by the disease situation and the burden of care. The Secretary of State of the Holy See, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, blessed the new center in the presence of the local authorities and the main donors, who gave about 3 million euros for the project. During the grand opening, the president of Bambin Gesù, Mariela Enoch, said that the center wants to be a welcoming space, similar to a large house, for young patients and to assist them in the best way, because it's always possible to provide care, as Pope Francis says, even when it's not possible to heal. The center consists of 30 housing modules where each patient is able to host family members next to them. Each module is equipped with a kitchen and a common space where the family can spend time together. There's also a chapel available for the sacraments and prayers. The walls are adorned with quotes and illustrations from the children's book, The Little Prince, to inspire the patients and, as the author Antoine de Saint-Exupéry puts it, to endure the presence of a few caterpillars to become acquainted with the butterflies. does art have in preserving the Christian heritage of the West and confronting a death of culture? Former head of the Knights of Columbus, Carl Anderson, spoke precisely on that topic at Rome's Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, also known as the Angelicum. The theme, the death of culture, which is really a very popular theme among secular uh, commentators, philosophers, and social critics. But for a Christian, we are not interested in the death of culture, we're interested in the resurrection of culture and a living culture because Christ is, for us, the center of our culture. Carl Anderson served as the Supreme Knight from 2001 to 2021, leading more than two million members and their families in living a life of Christian witness. One such witness that was often cited during his lecture was Pope St. John Paul II. St. John Paul II's greatest cultural contribution is to make it so clear to Christians that they have a responsibility to build a Christian culture through the culture of their life, through the culture of their Christian communities, to take responsibility for their fellows in society, that's the whole idea of solidarity. And that's the idea of building a civilization of love. During the lecture, Anderson quoted Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, who suggested that modern man has difficulties relating to the transcendent. Anderson indicated that historically, a solution to this problem has been the role of art. For this reason, the Knights of Columbus have been involved in the restoration of artwork in St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. We've had the privilege of working closely with the Fabrica. And I think the lesson for us in this long relationship is this was a moment, or many moments maybe, in Christian culture in which the prayerful worshiping community of Christians 
was able to express this communion with the Lord in a very beautiful and artistic way that raised their spirits and continues to raise the spirits of worshipers uh, for many centuries. While some may feel shipwrecked on an island in the sea of the culture of death, the great heritage of Christian artwork that we have been bequeathed and confined at St. Peter's Basilica contains a lifeboat for a resurrection of Christian culture. Hello, and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. Cardinal George Pell praised Mother Angelica as an outstanding example of woman in the Church, celebrating the Mass in Rome in commemoration of the sixth anniversary of her death. The Australian Cardinal said that Mother Angelica moved mountains and was a woman of deep struggle and prayer. Mother Angelica died March 27th, 2016 at the Easter Vigil, but her legacy lives on through the Eternal Word television network. Pope Francis consecrated Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary on March 25th. This was inspired by a century-old Fatima prophecy. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI and all of the bishops throughout the world were participating either virtually, connected via video link, or praying at the same time from their parishes. The Pope's renewal of the consecration came in response to the war in Ukraine. Pope Francis wished to Hong Kong Catholics to be good citizens and be courageous in the face of the challenging times. In a video message for Catholics in mainland China, the Pope commended them for their strength in enduring the suffering of the COVID-19 pandemic. The situation between Hong Kong and China is still very critical. A delegation of Canadian Indigenous people and Catholic bishops came to the Vatican from March 28th to April 1st. Their meeting with the Holy Father has been in the works since June 2021, following the reported discovery of unmarked gravesites at the site of formerly church-run schools in Canada. The delegation hopes to receive the support from Pope Francis for clarification on this case and justice. Last year, the Holy Father accepted the invitation to visit Canada. The Ecuador's new ambassador to the Holy See, Alicia de Jesus Crespo Vega, presented credential letters to Pope Francis. Before the new role, she had volunteered with Catholic organizations in the city of Guayaquil. The ambassador was accompanied by her husband, four children, and grandchildren. Ecuador will be hosting the 53rd International Eucharistic Congress in 2024. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of Vaticano. I'm Rachel Lanz with EWTN Vaticano in Rome. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. Following the historic trips of St. Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, Pope Francis is the third pontiff to visit Malta. On his two-day trip, there are two islands to visit, the island of Malta and the island of Gozo. The motto and the theme of this apostolic journey are taken from the Acts of the Apostles and read, they showed us unusual kindness. This passage refers to the story of how the Maltese people welcomed St. Paul after he shipwrecked here. And still today, local people here preserve the grotto where St. Paul lived during his time in Malta. The Archpriest of Malta's St. Peter's Basilica, Father Joseph Mitzi, 
says that he's very excited to welcome Pope Francis and show him the Grotto of St. Paul. Here he healed the sick, celebrated the Eucharist for the first time, proclaimed the Word of God, and also did the first baptisms. Here, the first Maltese community was born. And therefore, for us, this cave is holy because it is the cradle. Here is the beginning of the Catholic Church in Malta. That is why we continue to venerate it. Not only the stone, because the stone in itself means nothing, but we venerate what St. Paul taught us. So let us also continue in these days to receive the gift of the word and continue to proclaim it to the new generations. The Republic of Malta is a country located in the Mediterranean Sea between the coasts of Italy, Tunisia, and Libya. Its geographical location attracts many foreigners to visit the country or to migrate here. The patron of the Maltese church, St. Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, reminds us to evangelize foreigners with his example. He who is not afraid to find new encounters with the Gentile peoples continues to inspire us today to continue to find new means of communication to announce and proclaim to the whole world. The Republic of Malta consists of the main island of Malta and two smaller islands, Gosso and Comino. The island of Gosso has a Marian shrine of Our Lady of Tapinu, a destination for many pilgrims and for Pope Francis during his trip to the island. The rector, Father Gerard Buhajar, welcomes us to the shrine. This is the holiest and nearest place to the people, not only to the Gosa people, but also to the Maltese. It is a national shrine where they come from Malta and also from outside Malta because many Maltese immigrants have brought the image of Our Lady of Tapinu, not only as a memory or an image, but even carved in the hearts. Many of the people who come to this shrine have received graces, like Francesco, a living witness to the miraculous intercession of the Virgin Mary. I witnessed this miracle of a mother to whom the doctor, when she was pregnant, suggested to terminate the pregnancy to abort because there were no signs of any life. She always came here. This child was born with problems, was operated on, and today the child is one and a half years old, and the mother always says, I entrust my son to the Virgin of Tapino. Visiting the grotto in the Marian shrine of Tapino in Gosso, the Pope entrusted the people of Malta and the whole world to the protection of its patron, St. Paul. The Pope also visited the John XXIII Peace Lab, a center for migrants that embodies the spirit with which St. Paul was received by the Maltese people. It's not only a center that receives foreigners in need, but an example of education for peace, started decades ago by Franciscan friar, Father Dionisio Mintoff, who is 91 years old and currently accompanies 55 migrants who live here. He saw a leper, he saw the suffering, and when he saw the suffering, he didn't close his eyes. He went on the road to embrace him, and he said, it was my baptism. It was my day where God forgave me all my sins. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid when you meet with a plant of thorns. With the thorns may draw out blood, but do not be afraid. Because after the thorns, after the thorns, comes the flower. Joy that gives its fragrance.
For Father Dionisio, peace education begins with living close to the people who suffer in order to know their difficulties, to learn to walk with them and to help them with their problems. But all this must be lived at the same time with God. In this way, it will be possible to promote human dignity and defend the value of life in all environments, as St. Francis did. The three important characteristics to describe the church in Malta that Pope Francis reinforced with his visit are the legacy of St. Paul, the great devotion to the Virgin Mary in the invocation of Our Lady of Tapinu, and the pastoral care of welcoming that is so pivotal for the migrants that come to this island, as once the Maltese showed to St. Paul. The subject of the discussion today is very challenging indeed. What can we learn from the church when it comes to leadership in today's society? On March the 22nd, the EWTN Vatican Bureau hosted its third edition of Roman Nights, an event series that brings together experts from different professional backgrounds to discuss relevant topics of life and faith. It's a very challenging time to be a leader today and we need to work together. We need to learn from each other in order to lead our organizations you know, effectively, whether it be business, diplomat, or the church. Father Connor was joined by the Australian ambassador to the Holy See, Chiara Porro, and Italian businessman, Paolo Cuccia. All three agreed that in order to be a good leader, one has to be able to listen well. I do think that listening is one of the biggest qualities uh, and skills of any leader uh, and I was very much struck, I, I still remember this very clearly when I met Pope Francis to present my credentials, how intently he was listening to me. Um, it was quite quite incredible experience and I almost felt I had to stop speaking because <laughs> I was talking too much. I have many people in our organization that have shown leadership by their very commitment to want to give their life, to love, as you said, totally, for the church and for, for mankind. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kucha, um, from who did you learn how to lead? <laughs> uh, family, uh, extraordinary uh, teachers and professors of school. Uh, but then, I mean, it's uh, with the humility which <laughs> has been mentioned several times, very much by uh, people I meet uh, fr from, from the street to, to, to the business uh, in various situations. I am able to take this approach of uh, listening, uh, <laughs> because it starts from, from there. Uh, then, 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 then you get uh, lesson, uh, I get lesson from, from, uh, from many people. So the other thing that I think is very important is always to remember it's not just about the outcome. And I think the church here uh, um, you know, also has a lot of lessons for, for, for us. It's not just about the outcome, but it's about how you get there. Uh, if, if, you, if we talk about sustainability, uh, you need to bring everyone along. If not the outcome, it will be a temporary outcome or it will, you know, you'll, you'll celebrate its success for a day, but tomorrow uh, it's, it's fragile. Poro, a career diplomat holding different posts with the foreign ministry in the Australian capital of Canberra and overseas, shared that it can be quite a challenge balancing a diplomatic post and private life. The mother of two young children only arrived two years ago to Rome and had to build diplomatic relationships amid the mounting pressure and repeated lockdowns due to the COVID crisis. Speaking of diplomacy, she did comment on the current involvement of the Holy See in Ukraine, commending Holy See Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin and Pope Francis on their strong stance toward Russia. Despite not having an army or weapons of any sort, the Vatican still brings a lot of weight to the diplomatic table, she said. I think, I think what, what the Holy See really can, can add and can bring and, and what Pope Francis is doing, including you know, speaking today with, with um, the Ukrainian president uh, and, and with the head of, last week with the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, 
he's trying to create those opportunities for dialogue um, to bring 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 the sides together. And I think it's quite remarkable as well that the Ukrainians are calling uh, you know, for, for the Pope to visit, uh, which just shows the power um, that the church can bring uh, to, to these situations. We constantly need In conclusion, the speakers agreed that love was at the core of leadership. Father Connor urged the audience to collaborate in building communities where people feel respected and accepted in business, organizations, and in society as a whole. The evening concluded with a light reception where further ideas were shared and leadership discussed more in depth. We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. Conclave, from the Latin cum clave, which means closed with a key, evokes in our minds images of an orphan church that expectantly awaits the name of who will be the next successor of St. Peter. It makes us think to the cardinal electors gathered behind closed doors in the Sistine Chapel, where Michelangelo's universal judgment reminds us that they will have to give an account to God at the end of their days. But the word conclave also brings to mind the city of Rome, St. Peter's Square packed with the faithful who stare without blinking at the roof of the Sistine Chapel, waiting to see the color of the smoke from a chimney that will announce to the world the result of the votes. Well, throughout the history of the church, the election of pontiffs hasn't always been this way. In fact, until Pope Gregory X, successor of Peter number 184, the conclave as we know it today didn't exist. Some analogous form of enclosing the cardinals to elect the Pope had happened on some preceding occasions, always because the king and the emperors in Europe tried to apply pressure so that their favorites or those who favored them would be elected. The most striking case was in Viterbo, where it took three years from 1268 to 1271 to elect Tedaldo Visconti, Gregory X. On that occasion, after two years of indecision from the cardinals, the population locked them in with a key. Then they opened up the roof and left them bread and water to see if they decide. Given the situation that was created, Pope Gregory X promulgated this bull, Ubi Periculum, with which he formalized a series of rules to respect for the election of the Pope, thus formally instituting the conclave. And so, it's established that within few days, the cardinals must gather in the place of the death of the Pope, locking themselves in a place out of contact with the outside world. And then an entire series of restrictions, also material ones, precisely to induce them to keep the time brief for the decision. Ad avere tempi brevi nella decisione. But who was Tedaldo Visconti from Piacenza, and how did he become Pope Gregory the Tenth? Gregory the Tenth, al secolo Tedaldo Visconti di Piacenza. Gregory the Tenth. Then, Tedaldi Visconti di Piacenza was elected in 1271, which we could call the Proto-Conclave at Viterbo. His body is buried inside the cathedral. The cardinals who elected him in Viterbo agreed on this name after three years of sede vacante, also known as the empty seat. Tedaldo Visconti wasn't a bishop or a priest, but simply a deacon. But they chose him for his diplomatic skills. At the moment of the election, he was in the Holy Land and from there he was called on to return to Rome. But his mind remained forever tied to the Holy Land, so much so that the main climax of his papacy 
was the organization of a crusade to liberate the holy places. Gregory X was returning from the Council of Leon to Rome, and during the trip he decided to spend the Christmas festivities in Arezzo, which at that time was an important theological center between the Apennines and Rome. Gregory X knew many people in Arezzo. He was welcomed by Bishop Guglielmino degli Orettini in December of 1275. Unfortunately, he was already sick with a fever, and surely his condition worsened, and on January 10th, 1276, Gregory X died. Before dying, though, he left the city 30,000 gold florins, the sum that allowed for the construction of a new great cathedral in the center of the city. In urbe, al centro della città. Historians have two hypotheses about which was the precise place that the first conclave was celebrated, but what they have no doubt about is that it was in the city of Arezzo and that blessed Gregory X had the idea for this institution. A hypothesis is this placement here, where there already was a settlement of Dominicans, where the current basilica now is. Another hypothesis is the Church of St. Gregory, where today the cathedral and the bishop's residence are located, which are successive. Today, the body of Blessed Gregory X lies in the Cathedral of Arezzo, built thanks to the generosity of the very same pontiff, who from simple deacon in the Holy Land was called to Rome to occupy the Petrine Sea as the successor to St. Peter and head of the Universal Church. Thank you.